For those of you that are growing your celeriac along with us, you can see that one or two of these now um, have got their first true leaves. For us that means it's time to prick them out. So I'm just leaving the camera over these for now so that you can just see what they should be looking like. And I should begin to prick them out. Now I know that people say they have problems with celeriac and it is quite a tricky plant to grow. Once you get it going, absolutely fine and some wonderful harvests. But you can see that we have some more little seedlings pushing their way through. And that's because we actually had to re-sow some seed. We had good germination at first, but actually we've only got about 10 of the larger plants that are ready for pricking out. The rest that germinated on that occasion, for whatever reason, just didn't get any further. So we had to re-sow. So it's always a good thing to sow things like celeriac from mid-March, because you've got a fairly good window between mid-March and mid-April. They're not going to go out into the garden until the end of May, even June. They do require a long growing season, but if something just goes wrong with that germination process, or after they've germinated you suddenly lose some, you do still have time in that window just to re-sow. So let's be careful and lift one of these out. You can see those that have survived. have got a really good root system going on already. And that's what they do. They lay down that root system all of this time. The growth up top hardly seems to be doing anything. And you wonder if you're doing things right. But in fact, everything is going on downstairs. So we just make a hole into the compost and then drop that down. I'm going to put it right down to its first set of leaves. And that's the first one successfully pricked out. Now, if you remember, we also sowed the celery at the same time. And you can see they're doing the same thing. They're now starting to get their first true leaves. So what we shall do is exactly the same as we're going to do with the celeriac, and we're going to prick those out into these modules. Now I'm aiming for about 20 celeriac, if I can possibly get that. The rest of this module tray will be filled with these celery. In today's video, we are going to have a deep dive into the mid-spring garden. Now, we've been away for most of this week. We've been in London, we've been to Cambridge. I know, it's New Dig Norfolk Gardener on tour. <laughs> so we need to have a catch up with our garden ourselves. We'd love to take you along the ride with us. I want to try and use this deep dive to answer some of the questions because I do get asked, asked a lot of questions and you know, within the uh, comments section you know, I don't tend to write essays, um, it's just sort of quick answers to you to help you out and then we try to use those comments that you give us to then show you on film and then answer them in a much more fuller way. And it just so happens there were quite a few questions that had come in over the month of April that I thought we, as we go around and do the deep dive in the garden, we can actually answer. Now just for a change, I thought we'd start in plot five. Plot five is doing really, really nice. You remember there are onions under here. But look how well everything has come on. Those pak choy are absolutely romping away. And to the extent that's 
from this week I'm going to be harvesting some of the outer leaves for us to be able to use as a vegetable with our food. It seems to have worked really, really well, which I'm really pleased about because, you know, brassicas like the cauliflowers and the cabbages and the calabrese, you know, they need a lot of space because they will grow up to here and they will spread out to here. Not until June time when it's getting ready for its harvest. In the meantime, we can be enjoying these harvests. So, yeah, really, really pleased that we've been able to use this space and get ourselves a harvest while we're waiting for these brassicas to harvest. The ones in the bottle are looking quite... Um, I know we lost some of them, didn't we? They blew over. Yes, but they are growing in a much more upright habit, aren't they? They are. Just intrigued to see how that they uh, turn out. So we have some rhubarb today. First of the season. It's looking good. It's looking very good, isn't it? Very. The leeks, the poor Bella. They have germinated really well. Now the soft fruits, they're all doing really well. It was quite good that I think, I think it was on the last video, we show you the flowers, but actually if you look now, you can actually start seeing There's that definitely the little gooseberry fruit, is actually, there? yeah, it's now forming. Get a little, yeah, so things are moving on a pace. Black currants, they tend to come a bit later after the gooseberries. It's now getting all its leaves on there. But again, if you just look, you can see that where those flowers did come out early, there are little black currants that are now forming on these bushes. Polytunnel. Now, last about the polytunnel, we hadn't been in here for uh, a few weeks. Yeah, you're quite right. Generally, one of the reasons we don't always come in here is because it is plastic and everything, especially during the early part of spring and late winter, the light levels are quite low. And of course, it's been quite a windy old winter and spring, and it makes quite a bit of noise when it does that, which then picks up onto the microphone. I do always try and say to you all that the polytunnel basically mimics what we did in the greenhouse, just not so much of it. So we have spring onions in here, garlic, um, some of Mrs. W's overwintering plants, <laughs> shallots. Now we did have a row of carrots down here. The carrots didn't like it in here, but that was all part of the experiment. And of course on this side, we use this, nothing was planted in this side because this is where we use uh, the tables and things to keep our plants on until they are ready to go into the ground. You can see the tomatoes there, some more peas here, um, some more radishes that are now going to be ready to go into the ground. Mrs. W has her bedding plants here, some marigolds, tagetes. So yeah, usually we, where we can in the greenhouse, we'll use that to get these things uh, going. So they generally, we'll do the sowing over there, they then go down to the house to uh, germinate, and then from there once they're germinated up to the greenhouse, just to get them going a bit, because generally the light levels are better in there. And then once they sort of get to sort of this sort of stage, yeah, they can come over to here, and they'll sit here happily. Um, you know, the marigolds and the tagetes, for example, if they can't go out until getting towards the end of May. Any kind of frost, or indeed even really cold weather, they don't like it, and they'll just flop over and think, "I've had enough of this. <laughs> Forget it." Um, it's one of the principal reasons why you don't sell runner beans and French beans, really, until... Well, for us, I won't even sell ours until getting towards the end of May. I don't even want them anywhere until June. But, really, the earliest that you could, sort of, be thinking about sowing them would be mid to late April. And you'd need to have temperatures that are very kind to you. So that's the polytunnel and what's going on in there. And hopefully that answers some of those questions. You can see the strawberries here. They're all right. Um, the Cambridge favourites, they're now in flower. 
They should be because we should be seeing a harvest of those towards the end of May and into June. But in four are still really giving us many harvests, as you can see. The fact that we've not been here for most of this week, it's really pushed itself on. We need to harvest this, and we, indeed we shall harvest this as uh, we finish this film. It's doing really, really well. And I just want to show you the carrots. These ones that germinated first, these are a variety called Norwich. They're actually now starting to get their first true leaves, what we recognise as a carrot leaf. Now, I've just had the covers off these onions, just so that I can have a bit of a weed through. See, there's ample space that I can actually run the hoe through, should I want to. Onions don't tolerate weeds very well. And you can see in here that these onions are looking really quite good. They went in mid-March, around about the 20th of the month. But they've really come on leaves and bounds. And that will be because of the fleece cover that we've had on them. People often say you can sell your parsnip seeds in February or March. Indeed you can. And in some seasons, some years, or maybe if you're in a really sheltered part or you live in the most warmest parts of the UK, you can get away with that. But I can assure you we won't here. And if your soil temperatures are not the right temperature, these are just going to sit here and sulk. And you can see they are really wafer thin. So if it's a really windy day, they'll blow away. A bit like porridge oats. They do, don't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but not as heavy. <laughs> But equally, if the soil is cold, wet, damp, any of those things, they're going to rot. There's not a lot to them. Now, my preferred planting method is to put two to three seeds at each station. And then when they germinate, we shall go and thin them to the strongest seedling. So hopefully in that way, we will always have a seedling at the station where we want it. You could sow them as you do other seeds, but then you would have quite a lot of thinning to do. And sometimes if they don't grow in the right place, you won't get the desired distance between each plant. You can put these as close as four inches, but we tend to put them around about six inches. You can see that the uh, shallot and garlic bed, that's doing fine, they're looking after themselves. And then the broad beans. You can see they've got, you know, another three or four inches taller since we last looked at them the other week. Um, we decided it was time to get the stakes in so that we can run the strings down. We use the strings rather than individually stake each plant because we do grow quite a few. One of the questions somebody actually did ask me was about the flowers. Um, and the frosts. Don't be too concerned about that. The flowers on here now will, will not always produce pods. If we were to get a frost now and those flowers went by the wayside, it would produce some more. And you would still get a harvest of broad beans. They're pretty good like that. I've had them out here and they've, there's been flowers on them sometimes in the beginning of April. It was in them on towards the, the end of March, mid to the end of March. But of course, in those years, we had a spring that's not like a spring in the UK. These have actually got the flowers much later for us. I've seen them on there much earlier than that in years gone by. And that's because it has been that bit cooler. They also aren't as advanced and as tall. So they're actually behaving the way that they should do.
One thing I would say is that when you do put stakes in, whether they're staked individually or whether they're like this, do look to put something on the top. Because sometimes when you're not thinking about things, you can easily bend down and actually poke your eye out with a cane or at least do yourself some severe damage and gardening is meant to be a happy time, not an A&E time. <laughs> now in plot two, you can see the potatoes, oh, they're pushing on. If you remember the last time you saw these, they were about that big, about an inch out of the ground. And I actually just earthed them up, hilled them up. You'll hear it called, we call it composting up. Even they have, I didn't put an awful amount on them, it's just that I knew it was going to get down to about plus three or four, according to the app. But I always think to myself, so for argument's sake, this Tuesday we're expecting a plus two on, on the weather app. It's telling it's going to be plus two. That's pretty cold. Well, it's not going to be cold enough to damage these if that's what happens, but I tend to find these apps could be two degrees either way. So... I should be out here after work, Monday evening, and I shall get some more compost on top of these just so that they remain protected. If it's a day where I can't actually do that, if Monday's weather is not so good, then I would just run a fleece over the top. The beetroot has actually come on really, really well since we've got it covered. The birds can no longer peck at those. And uh, yeah, really quite pleased with those. They've recovered really quite well. They did look a bit of a mess before we actually put a cover over them. We generally get birds that peck at beetroot early in the year, but hadn't seen quite the damage that they were doing to these ones this year. You can see this is what the pigeons will do. This is pigeons that have done this. They've stripped these leaves. Um, I think I caught this with a lawnmower the other week and obviously it just moved it along a bit. Well, actually, I probably didn't. It's not quite long enough to, no, to cover those, is it? The, the end has got caught inside. Ah, yes. There we are. But you can see the difference it makes if these are covered. Look, look, at, this, look at these. The leaves are all quite really good. Luckily, these had formed... a a radish before those leaves were pecked but that's the sort of damage that pigeons will do to your crops and of course we're right at the beginning on plot one and if you remember the brassicas that went in here and I did get asked by somebody in the comments about what I used to control the slugs because these are looking so well nothing we don't use any form of slug pellets whatsoever whether they are organic usage or yeah we just don't use anything and that's not being big-headed or anything like that we just if we don't have to we won't use it we don't have to so we don't use it i think firstly when these plants go in we put them in much smaller than you see other people do, so they quickly establish themselves into their positions and they grow away. Look how large these are. You saw the onions in plot four. They went in the same day as these, so round about the 20th of about March. March old. If you're new to our channel, go back and watch that video back in March. They were literally about that big. And look how well they're doing now. They've gotten themselves away. They're not so susceptible to uh, slugs because they're strong, healthy plants. But also, if you've got a soft underside like slugs do, why would you want to crawl along here? It's actually really quite a difficult thing to do for them. Not impossible. I'm not saying we don't get slugs, in fact, here, look, you can see here, it's a bit of damage on that plant there. And it's probably because it's right near the edge. The other thing that we do is obviously keep our grass as short as possible and the edges trimmed back, which is a job that I have to do after this film finishes. As I say, being away for most of the week. <laughs> 
having been here actually to do that job. And then lastly in plot one, you can see we have our new potatoes. This is Casablanca, they're coming on really nicely. And again, bearing in mind it's going to be a plus two, we are going to just drop a bit of fleece over this just so that they stay protected too. I was actually quite horrified the other day. I was watching something and somebody was saying, whoever I was watching was saying that the potatoes are safe now because they've pushed through the surface. Oh no. Now they're at their most vulnerable. That's why we plant them at certain times and you keep an eye on your last frost date. Now, as we said in, I think, I think it was our last video, it might have been the one before, we did get some peas. They are in the ground. We would have liked more, but there is nigh on 100 pea plants here, isn't there, Mrs. W? My original plan was to put... <laughs> you see what I've put up with, folks? It's all for me and none for him. But actually, my plan was to be able to grow enough so that I could put some on this side of the arch and some on this side and then let them grow over. But they just didn't germinate, germinate well enough and we just couldn't do that. We saw the celeriac earlier where we had some tiny seedlings just die on us. That didn't happen to us at all last year. And I think the year before that we had really severe problems trying to germinate it, didn't we? So, yeah, you'll always get your challenges, but that's what makes gardening such fun. It really does. Now, just to end the video, I just want to show you quickly in the greenhouse all the things that I say you can be done. If you haven't done them, you know, it's not, you don't have to do things on, you know, the first of something or the second of something. With Sonos squash, you can see that they're germinating. There's some hunter. We've got our cucumbers through, Passandra. The fact of the matter is, if you haven't sown those yet, there's still plenty of time. The one cucumber we haven't sown yet is market more, and we shall do that actually this week, right at the very end, because it won't be ready to go into the garden until actually these temperatures really do warm up. If you put those out there now, they're not going to be happy at all. <laughs> Whereas the Passandra, which will grow under cover, yeah, they will actually grow into the borders, within the next two weeks. And you'll see when we do that. We are also getting prepared to put our pepper plants in. Remember the pepper plants that we overwintered? In our opinion, it's about time for them to go into the ground now. It's going to, it's going to be the beginning of May. So probably uh, the week after next, we shall get those pepper plants into the ground right at the beginning of May. And you can see we just got a few more radish to take out. Rather large radish. Torpedoes. <laughs> and They've got huge, haven't they? They have, haven't they? And uh, yeah, you can see this was the line where we were going to put those. And then the tomatoes dot in towards front and back. Because I do get asked quite a lot about the peppers and the chilies that we overwintered. And no, you don't always get to see them because they're actually down in our house. <laughs> they're not anywhere up here at the moment. Now, as we approach the end of April, if you remember right at the very beginning, when we talked about the jobs for April, I said that April is actually, I find, one of the most busiest months in the gardening calendar. There will be other busier months. May is also a busy month. There's a lot to plant out. You see what's on your bench. But a lot is already out and a lot has already been sown. And a lot of that was do done during the month of April. Not only that, but we've reconfigured the compost bays. Not quite finished. Not quite finished, but it's been done. 
starting to get the hoops over the things that need to be replaced. We saw the carrots earlier. They're not going to have that black mesh over them anymore. When this is finished, we're going to get some hoops to put over there so that they are well protected. I don't want them seeing the light of day until I actually want to pick them and keep that carrot root fly at bay. Now, do let us know in the comments down below what you've been up to during April. I'm pretty sure yours will have been just as busy as ours, if not even busier. I forgot we painted the shed as well, didn't we, this month? Yeah. It has been a busy April, hasn't it? But we shall be back very soon. It'll be the beginning of May then. Till next time. <laughs>